We want to continue where we left off last week. Uh, last week we, uh, we started a series on overcoming sin, and we want to continue with that, with that line of thought for a few minutes here this evening. So as we think of overcoming sin, you know, of course we talked about some ways that we can that we can do that last week, but realize that the Bible commands sinners to repent. If we go to the book of Luke to begin with here. Luke chapter 13, and we're going to go to verse 3. Luke 13 at verse 3 says, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So as we think about the idea of repentance, we talked about it at the end of the lesson this morning. We often speak about repentance and what it is. It's realizing the, the, the direction of our life is not leading us to the Lord, being sorrowful for that to the point that we desire deeply to change our ways. If we, um, if, if we read again in verse 5, we see that same sentiment repeated there in Luke 13. At verse 5 again, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's an important part of, of the Christian's beginning walk and continual walk. In Acts 2 at verse 38, on that day of Pentecost, we see that there are people that were cut to the heart and they repented of their sins and they asked, what must we do? It commanded in their hearts a change. And I, I ask you, as you work to overcome sin in your lives each and every day, can you can you honestly say that you're cut to the heart? Does it bother you? Does it make you sorrowful that you've, that when, when you've done something that is contrary to the, to the will of the Lord? I hope it does. And not because I want you to be sorrowful and sad, but because it takes that to make a change. Thinking back to even perhaps our childhood, we think of the times where we where we got into trouble with our, with our parents or perhaps with the principal at school. And it, it was a very uh, difficult time when you got called into the principal's office or, or your parents had to sit you down and say, okay, listen up and, and give you a little bit of a straightening out. And that was an uncomfortable time and one that you probably wish you could escape from. But unless that happened, then the change wouldn't have happened and I think we can see that if we honestly look back I have told you before many times about the students when I used to teach drivers training and how I would have students from all walks of life and family backgrounds and a few really stick in my mind uh, one in particular that I know I've mentioned before was a young man whose mother just basically lived at the local bar. She stayed inebriated most every hour of the day. And when uh, I picked him up for several lessons, he would say, oh, my mom's not home. I think I needed her to sign a paper or something. And he'd say, well, she's not home. And I'd say, do you know when she'll be back? And he'll say, no, I think she slept at the, in the parking lot of the bar last night. Uh, I don't really know when she'll be home. Sometimes it could be a week. He was on his own. Come to find out that, that uh, he was expecting a child with his, with his girlfriend and he'd been in so much trouble at school that they kicked him out, that he'd been to juvenile, uh, the juvenile detention center and, and on and on and on the story of this kid's life, no one was there to correct him. No one was there to say, hey, maybe you should go down this path. And we understand that from that, from that standpoint we, we can see that, I think, in the world today when we see someone going astray. But uh, the same thing applies to us in our, in our spiritual life 
Sometimes we need that correction, even though it's not comfortable. Now, a Christian must crucify or put to death that old man of sin. You know, that's uh, familiar language. Uh, we know coming from the scriptures. You know, we, we have to uh, put to death that old man of sin. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 at verse 6. Let's go back a, another verse or two. Let's start at verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And when you think about the sins that have, that have grabbed a hold of you in your life, they really do make you a slave, don't they? You don't have, you're not exercising your own will uh, oftentimes when you get in the depths of this thing. I mean, you make the choice, make no mistake. It is our will that brings us to that place. But it comes to the point where it controls you. The adrenaline rush that you might get from, from whatever it is, whether it be looking upon something that you shouldn't, whether it be uh, taking part in a substance, abusing a substance that, that uh, alters your mind, whether it be the rush that comes from being angry. If you uh, have ever been really angry and afterwards when you come down off of that you can feel the adrenaline rush and people get addicted to that. People get addicted to that sort of a thing and of course we understand that kind of rage is, is a sinful thing. And as we, uh, as we realize as Christians, we need to put that old man to death. That shouldn't be a part of our lives. The things that we would normally look at and, and condone uh, in, our, in our worldly lives, we, we, we don't want anything, any part of that anymore. We don't want to give off the appearance that we are condoning certain things you know there when i'm when i'm on uh facebook and and on social media i have come to the realization which i think is wisdom that uh as i post things on online that uh i need to be careful about the source of the things that i post because someone can click on that post and see perhaps something that I never meant them to meant for them to see or I never condoned or never thought I was condoning in sharing something but uh, lo and behold someone might get something from it and I am going to be a partial cause of that you know perhaps images of sinful things you know images that glorify alcohol drugs lifestyles that are not according to the will of the Lord. Those things, we, we, have, we have no reason to be uh, involving ourselves in such things as Christians. You know, as we, uh, as we think about this old man of sin, we realize that, he's not, uh, that we're not allowed to walk anymore in those sins and that he's been buried again. Romans 6, uh, again, speaking of that. The burden of responsibility for quitting sin lies solely within us, the sinner. You know, one of the things, and it's a lesson that I've had to learn, it's a lesson that I try to, uh, to project on to my, my children and people that, that I have sway over, is that we need to be responsible for our actions. And sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we just drop the ball. Sometimes we just don't hold up our end of the bargain with others and with God. And instead of our, what I think is usually our go-to, uh, is but, 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 they made me, but, 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 
I was only trying to, but, 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 just say, all right, you're right, I did that. I'm going to do better next time. That's a hard lesson to, that's a hard lesson to grab a hold of, uh, but as hard as it is, we have to say that and mean it and strive to do better the next time. You know, we, as we look into the scriptures, we realize that there are those that fell, that fell again after having put on Christ. But through the prayers of the saints, through, through repentance, uh, again, that forgiveness is extended to us if we turn our back on those, sin, on those sins. You know, it, it, as we think about overcoming sin, we have to first realize that it is our job to do the turning away. It's our job to, to hold up our end of the bargain, as we sort of mentioned this morning, that you know, we have a contract, if you will, with Christ. When we are buried in the waters of baptism, we are in effect signing a contract saying, I am going to give my life over to the ways of the Lord. What a scary thing to be standing before the Lord with a broken contract. You know, it's scary enough if you break a contract on, uh, on this earth with men and you find yourself in court uh, or having to deal with, with that sort of uh, situation, but how much worse to be standing before the Lord having broken that trust. You know, we need to remember that we have a compassionate Savior when we are working to overcome sin. You know, oftentimes I'll hear people, and I have heard many times, people say, well, there's no way that the Lord could possibly forgive me. I've done too much. Or, uh, or they get this idea, and they get this idea from Satan, uh, and the confusion that is sown by Satan, that, uh, th that the, the Lord is sitting there waiting to strike you with, with a lightning bolt, that the Lord is uncompromising, which he is, but that he doesn't forgive. We get a very different view when, when we uh, allow the lies of Satan to sneak into our lives. But we need to remember that we have a compassionate Savior. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4 and at verse 15. It says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have that compassionate Savior. We have that Savior that understands the temptation that we go through. He understands and he has the way out. We don't have to give in to those things. We can cast our cares upon him. You know, if we go to 1 Peter 5, starting at verse 6, we read, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. It goes on to tell us that we should be watchful, it's not to mean that we, have no, that we have no thought in this thing. After all, we have free will. But we have to be those that can cast our care upon him. Those that can understand that no matter what happens to our physical body, the Lord has us. That we may lose this physical life. In fact, unless the Lord comes back first, we will lose this life. And our hope lies in heaven after this life, if we are yet obedient to him. In overcoming sin, we have to remember to cast our care upon him. I think this is something that we struggle with. It became absolutely evident, and when I say we, I mean everybody in the world uh, struggles with this. And over the past couple of years, haven't we really seen that? Haven't we really seen the, um, the, the, the cares of the world taking people's lives over? 
Sadly, I've heard of, uh, I've heard of brethren that through, through the time of COVID uh, have not come back to the assembly for fear, for fear that they might get sick. What a sad statement that uh, a person who progress, pro professes Christ can be shattered by fear from some earthly disease. It's something that we, that we have to think about when we are told to cast our burdens upon him. He means it. And, and we need to, of course, do our due diligence. And of course, we should take precautions uh, you know, in our lives. And we should think. And as we mentioned, it, as you read the next couple of verses, it tells us to be careful. And especially to be careful about those that, that can spiritually ruin your soul if you allow them. But our, our cares belong with him. Not with us to try to figure a way out. Not with us to try to find the best way through, but with him. Remember also that God wants to forgive. You know, he's given us a way out from the very beginning, from the, the fall in the Garden of Eden. He's been working to give us this way out, which is Christ. He wants to forgive us. He doesn't want anyone to, to, to fall victim to sin. He's long-suffering and waiting for us to come around to his way of thinking. Again, in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, at verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Reminding us in verse 10 that the, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night so that we should be prepared. But remember that God wants to forgive all. And if you're living and breathing, you're part of that all. Uh, the, the Satan and the lies that he produces uh, would like you to believe that there's only a select few or that God's not going to save, uh, doesn't want to save everybody, but that he just that he's a respecter of persons which we find in the scriptures is not the case god wants to forgive and he wants to forgive all we need to remember to pray for god's help we our morning lesson was on prayer and it's a cornerstone of what our daily walk with the lord should be uh, having that ability to pray that willingness to pray. Let's go on over to the book of Isaiah and at chapter 45 at verse 10. Isaiah 45 at verse 10 says, Woe to him who says to his father, What are you begetting? Or the woman, what have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. We need to remember to ask the Lord. We need to remember to ask for the help that is available from the Lord. Remember that we're not alone in this. And as we, as we continue on in our walk, we have one another. You know, t together here today, you have a group of people that is willing to help each and every other person here in this, in this assembly. And if you have a need, something that you're struggling with, then by all means, let it be known so we can pray together. We, we know that the uh, effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We we read that scripture yet this morning. So as we continue to think about overcoming sin, we need to remember to use the power of the scriptures. Now we have this handbook, if you will. We have this uh, law book that tells us all the things that pertain to life and godliness. We have each and everything that we need. We are 
thoroughly furnished, complete. Let's go to Ephesians 6, at verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You know that the word of God is a protector for us. You read the previous verses reading about the whole armor of God. Well, the scriptures, that sword of the spirit, if you will, can help us find our way through the issues of life. Remember to use the power of the scriptures. Remember it's not our power that does anything. As we share the gospel with others, sometimes we would like to pat ourselves on the back, perhaps, and say, well, maybe I can get through to him. Maybe I have the right words. Maybe I have the right rapport with the person that perhaps he'll listen. But remember, it's the word of God that does the saving. It's the word of God that does the heart changing. And if we use that, we can be effective. We just need to trust in him and his word that he's given to us that we might be able to be with him after this life. You know, so as we wrap this, these thoughts up, as we uh, end out our thoughts on overcoming sin, and there's so much more that could be said, we could carry this on for weeks and weeks and talk about ways to overcome sin. But let's remember our compassionate Savior, cast our cares upon him, remember that he wants to forgive, remember to pray for his help, and again, refer back to the lesson this morning on just how powerful and helpful prayer can be. And remember to use the scriptures. It has the power to change hearts. So realizing all these things, realizing that sin must be overcome, realizing that you must be faithful to God if you want to go to heaven, there is simply no other option. You must forsake sin. You have to get it out of your life, as difficult as it may be. And there will be days when you, you, you realize that, oh, that thing I've been doing, that's, that's not good. I should probably change my ways. There will be those days, and they may be hard days, but we must forsake sin. Realizing that our enemy, the devil, is always on the prowl, seeking whom he may devour. Realizing that you can indeed resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let's go over to um, the book of James. Go into the book of James 4, chapter 4, at verse 7. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The purifying of the heart comes from the scriptures, comes from the word. Let's go a couple pages over to 1 Peter chapter 5. And at verse 9, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now, speaking again in the preceding verses about being sober and being vigilant, realizing that we're all in this together, there's, no, there's nothing that you're going through that isn't common to all mankind. There's nothing that you're going through that the Lord doesn't know about and doesn't understand. And you can make a change in your life. Most of all, you know, if, if, uh, if, if nothing else, you can take this idea and this concept with you out to the world and to others and help them to come to realize that they can overcome sin. Realize that the Lord is there for them. Now there's uh, 
just no two ways about it. You must get rid of sin. And as we share that truth with others, we need to ask them if they will indeed take take that lifeline that is being offered by the Lord and seek that way of escape. We can be a, a, of assistance uh, to others when they study with us. Uh, we need to pray and look for those opportunities uh, to study with others. You know, I'm convinced that, you know, the church is not going to grow, the church worldwide is not going to grow because of some social media campaign, because of some podcast, or because of the words of some smooth-talking preacher. But the world can change and turn towards the Lord one by one because somebody in their life cares enough about them to share the truth of the gospel with them. Again, it's not about the person, but about the word of God. So with those thoughts in mind, I ask you this evening, if you uh, need to put on Christ in baptism, the waters are ready behind me. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need that support and that help through a difficult time, that's what we're here for. Uh, please take advantage of that, of that gift that the Lord has given to us as brethren in Christ. Whatever your need may be, please come forward as we stand and sing.